Well, good morning, church. It is great to be with you all. If you guys could uh, make your way back to your seats. Um, it is Palm Sunday. We are at the triumphal entry of the week before Jesus' death and resurrection. And it is just such an awesome morning to uh, remember that. Uh, but also, I want to encourage you all uh, with inviting people. We've been asking you guys to invite people. We, I, I think generally, uh, if you think about something else that you really think is good, it's easy to talk to people about it. Uh, if you uh, have a great job, or if you just read a new book, or you're like that recent advertisement, like the podcaster guy that always talks about podcasts. It used to be CrossFit like 10 years ago. You always talk about CrossFit if you do CrossFit. It's like, I got this great podcast. You share it. His church is uh, by far more valuable than any of those other groups, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I just want to tell you, I'm also not awesome at inviting people to church. It is a little weird being the pastor of the church where you're like, hey, come to this church I'm a part of. And then they show up and they're like, you're a part of it, you know? <laughs> like, um, it's an honor. But uh, this past week, uh, I took my cards and I was like, yeah, I'm going to hit up Fitness Connection. That's my third space. And I go in, you know, and I'm looking for certain people that I've already started to try and talk to. And I just want to tell you a little bit about my journey. This is Friday morning. I actually went to the gym so that I could invite people. I like didn't want to go. I'm like, I've already worked out a couple times. I'm like, no, there's people I need to invite. I got like 200 cards. I need to give half of them in person is my goal, right? I'm, I'm doing okay so far. So I walk in and the two people at the front desk, they're easy because they're like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, great. Uh, if you don't have plans for Easter, here's like part of this cool church. You should come down. And they were kind of like weird about it. They're like, okay. And I'm like, oh, nice, to, you know, have a great day, or whatever. And I just walk away, and I'm like, this is going great. Um, <laughs> and then as I'm doing my workout, and I, I'm a little bit older, so I don't do heavy lifting. I'm not in there to, like, get uh, PRs or anything. But I do circuits. So I'll do, like, 10 circuits of the same thing. And today I was doing shoulders. And so I was doing, like, a pr push press and then flies, and then I call them smileys where you just pull it up like this. And I'm thinking about who to invite and I see some people that I know, and I'm like, okay, I can go up and, you know, talk to them. But then I'm like, there's a lot of other people I don't know that I see all the time. And I'm like, this is going to be awkward. Like, the first time I talk to you is to invite you to church. So I'm like, man, it's like, I, the thought came really quickly. I feel like the Holy Spirit was just like downloading teachings as I'm thinking about trying to invite people to his bride is uh, as much as we can be really, really disciplined about workout regimens or your diet or your work diligence, could I also be that disciplined with inviting people? And so, no joke, I would do my shoulder presses and my flies and my smileys. I'm like, all right, time to invite somebody. And I'd grab a card and I'd walk up randomly. I wrote all the names down. The first guy's name is Zach. And I'm like, what's up, man? I'm Thaddeus. Uh, what's your name? He's like, Zach. I'm like, hey, I'm part of this church. Uh, if you don't have plans for Easter, we'd love for you to be there. We're down at Sun Valley at 10. You know what he said? Thanks so much. I was like, that was good. <laughs> I turn around, I go do my next set, right? And then I see somebody else. And I'd actually, I work out in this, there's this like fake grass area. And I'm like, this is my area. If you come in here, I'm inviting you, you know? <laughs> so I go up another, her name is Allie. And I'm like, hey, uh, my name's Thaddeus. What's your name? She's like, Allie. And I'm like, hey, I'm part of this church. I just want to invite you. It's next. She's like, thank you. I was like, this is good. I'm on a roll, right? And just like, but it was still like, I had to like, okay, now is when I'm going to do it. I couldn't just like wait until the moment was perfect. And the other piece too, for me, and maybe you're like this, is I'm a big fan of relational evangelism. I want to get to know someone and know their story and them know me because people let you in and I want to develop her. And I'm like, God, I can't like just go up to, you know, there's this guy, I see him every day I come in and I've never talked. I can't just start this. But I go, well, it's another set, so I got to go up, and so it's Dustin, and he was a little bit like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm like, all right, I was like two for two, and now it's like two for three, I'm doing okay, um, but then it was Adam, who's a guy that I've met before, and he sometimes gives me the cold shoulder when I come in, it's cool, I didn't call him an angel, um, and he's like, oh, that's great, thanks so much, he starts chatting, and then there was uh, another couple, Carol and John, and I just go, hey, my name's Thaddeus, it's, I just did another set of inviting people, so I have to invite you, you know, and then another uh, girl, Yasna, and I go up and I'm like, hey, if you don't have plans, uh, you know, I'm part of this church, you know what she says to me is then, like, how God speaks through other people, so I'm like, how's your workout going, and she's like, man, I'm, 
I'm tired, but you know what? I showed up. And I was like, sometimes I think you just got to show up. You don't have to feel great. You don't have to be super pumped and super confident and super. If you ever go to the gym, you don't only go when you feel great. You go because you know it's good for you, right? And so I was like, all right, I'm writing all these things down. I'm like, God, you're so good. And it's just like, you know, just show up. Maybe you've never lifted that muscle in your life, the invite a friend to church muscle. It's like, just show up. Just do it. I'd also say don't overdo it. You'll be sore for like a week, right? And after that, I, I think I invited about 10 people, gave them all cards, and it was funny, the last person in her name was Laura that I invited. She actually was very clear as soon as I started talking to her that she did not speak English as a first language. And I was like, love for you to come, and then I ran out of invites. And I was like, uh-oh, what if there's somebody else that I need to invite? Got to go all the way to my truck, <laughs> you know, and get, the, get more invites. But I, I just would encourage you, uh, this being the triumphal entry, the Palm Sunday week, people have it on their minds. They know it's spring break or Easter. And Eric was sharing this morning about it being triumphal entry and how the people expected something of Jesus, but he was going to do something really different. And, and this is a big perhaps. But Jesus was making his entry into the heart of Israel, to Jerusalem. It's the hot spot of God's presence. And I wonder if today, Jesus might be making his way into the heart of people who are lost. Like today, it might be the day. Maybe you've invited them, maybe you're, you're a friend, they know you're a Christian, and today they're like, remember that guy I work with? <laughs> you know? Remember that mom that hangs out? Like people... Today could be the day that Jesus is making his triumphal <laughs> entry into the lives of other people, and he's going to restore them. He's going to bring them home, as we just sang. So I would encourage you, wherever you're at, maybe you're crushing it, you're better than me. I texted somebody in our church after, and I said, hey, you encourage me. I, I, I said, if so-and-so can do this, I can do it too. And so if I can do it and awkwardly get weird looks and other people that kind of shrug their shoulders at me, you can too. We want to continue in our series. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to be uh, in verse, uh, the first verse will be verse 1, uh, but I do want to say that last week's message uh, from Jesus through me, the disciple doesn't, was hard. He said a disciple that doesn't hate others in comparison to how much they love me. A disciple who doesn't carry their own cross, a disciple who doesn't give up, release all of their possessions, can't. And I think the thing that I missed is that all of these things are really hard because of our sin nature, but they are the absolute best for us. Friends, consider relationships. All of the other relationships that you have pale in comparison to the relationship with God. He will never fail you. You must love him because it is the best thing for you. Amen. <laughs> Carry your cross, say Jesus is in control, because he is. <laughs> and all the other crosses that we carry, all the other things that we say, this is in charge of my life, they're not nearly as good of a king, nor a part of a kingdom like his. Amen. When he says, give up your possessions, they're already his. And he has so much more to offer you, which we will see in Luke chapter 15. So much more than you can fathom are, is at his disposal. And so as much as it's a hard call, and I hope, well, you're still here today, but I hope you wouldn't turn away when you say count the cost. That's what the subtitle is in my Bible, the cost of discipleship. It's heavy because today is when chapter 15, you really get to see the compassion of Jesus. And, and I would say second to the cross, maybe the clearest picture of God's compassion for the lost. So we do a thing where we bring out the book and then we praise him and then I'll pray. And so you can yell at me, bring out the book if it's your first time. You can yell super loud too because uh, we got some NC State fans in here and they've been yelling all weekend. And so now we're going to carry that over. And UNC fans, sorry. I know, a couple of you. Um, where's Alabama fans too? I'm an Alabama fan. Uh, I couldn't tell you one player on their basketball team, by the way. Um, but anyways, we want to make it about Jesus, not about sports, at least for right now. And, uh, I'm going to say three, two, one, you can yell, bring out the book. We're going to praise him again. And then we're going to pray three, two, one. Bring out the book. 
Bring out the book. Let's praise him. Let's make much of him. Amen. Hallelujah. God, you're good. So God, we uh, want to love you with all of our heart. God, every part of us to love you. We want to love you with all of our soul. All that we are, all the spiritual side of us, would it worship you more than the other things? God, we want to love you with our minds. God, this morning, would we, uh, would we have the ability to put aside the other things that are on our minds and pursue you with the minds that you give us? God, we also want to love you with all of our strength. We want to love you well and with passion and with energy. God, uh, we thank you for your book. We thank you uh, for showing us who you are, for inviting us into relationship. We thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sacrifice that, oh man, we just were so far away taking what you've given us uh, for granted and uh, you came after us. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in our lives and we thank you for your presence in this room and we give you this time and ask you to move and speak and work. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen, amen. Luke 15 verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. If you know anything about the Bible, tax collectors were despised. They were Jewish, and they were working to collect taxes for either the Pharisees or for Rome. And worse than that is that they often, because they had the protection of the Roman guard, could skim off the top and overcharge their own Jewish brothers and sisters. And sinners here is a general term for somebody who didn't keep the law or, in a very negative way, uh, wasn't smart enough to understand it in order to keep it. It's interesting, too, if you just look at these two verses, that verse 1 sums up the entire preceding section. Look at uh, verse 35 of chapter 14, the end. Jesus says what? Whoever has ears to what? Hear, let them hear. And then verse 1 of chapter 15 says, Now the tax collectors, those evil people, and sinners generally, were all gathering around to hear Jesus. The cost of discipleship is high, and who shows up to hear them? The the riffraff, people that were not respected and maybe even despised. (laughs) And it's interesting, too, because if you admit yourself to be a sinner, if you strip off pride... The worst of type of pride is religious pride, that I'm really good. Rip off folly and acknowledge that you have nothing to bring. You'll find yourself seeking Jesus, hearing him, and Jesus welcoming you into a dialogue. But notice, verse 2, the religious leaders are muttering, which harkens back to Israel, grumbling against God. But notice what their complaint is about. And sharing a meal was, had a ton of implications. Religiously, socially, morally, politically, everythingly, right? Every, every, you didn't do it. But notice their complaint. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. <laughs> I just want to tell you that uh, sometimes praise comes through infants, and prophecy comes through donkeys, and truth comes through religious leaders. There. J.C. Ryle says it this way, the very saying which was meant for reproach was adopted by the Lord Jesus as a true description of his office. The testimony of the Pharisees and lawyers was strictly and literally true. This man welcomes sinners. He welcomes us. He eats with us. Amen. I love the message version. It says he kept company with people of doubtful reputation. 
And I wonder for us too, as much as it can move us, that he welcomes us. We also are people that say we want to follow Jesus. We want to become like him and do the things that he's doing. Is what company are you keeping? Do you spend time with people of doubtful reputation? Do you spend time with the riffraff of society? Or do you just spend time with people that seem righteous? Who are we keeping company with? Jesus is going to go into verse 3. Man, two verses, right? Rich. You can read the Bible cover to cover in a year, and you can never plummet its depths, right? He's going to go into three parables, starting in verse 3, and it's the lost sheep, uh, which Matthew's gospel also has, but then the lost coin, which is unique to Luke, and then the lost son, or the prodigal son, which is unique to Luke's gospel. I just want to let you know that we're going to skip the prodigal son today. It's going to be the focus for tomorrow, but we are going to talk about the prodigal older son. I'll give you a nugget, though, for next Sunday. I I love the picture when uh, the prodigal knows that he's messed up and then he comes home. I just want to tell you this. Knowing you've made a mess of your life isn't enough. You got to come home. But hey, we're not doing it today. It's next Sunday. Stop it. It's just a nugget. It's good, right? There's so much. But we're going to look at the older brother because there's something that I think specifically for us who are quote unquote Christian, we need to see that. But let's look at verse three. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Note too, the three parables are going to have an increasing value. One in a hundred, one in 10, one in two. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And I believe Jesus saying tongue in cheek. 99 people who don't need to repent. Notice here the first parable that he gives about seeking for that which is lost is this sheep symbolizes us, all of humanity, specifically that we have gone astray. And you think about a sheep wandering about from one craving to the next, eyes only on what is immediately ahead. Actually, in uh, sign language, if you make this sign, it means that you're a cow eating grass And it means that you're oblivious. You're just eating. This is all you're doing. But sheep do that. They just eat and they eat. They are short-sightedly unaware that it's not where it should be, all the while straying further and further from the fold. We've gone astray, craving after craving, not knowing that we've left the fold And the shepherd symbolizes God, but specifically the person of Jesus Christ. And it's all throughout the Old Testament. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a couple passages, and I've asked them not to put them on the screen because I think it's really good for us to look at the word ourselves. So flip back with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at verse 11. This is a clear picture. You know, you think about Old Testament pictures, Isaiah, Jeremiah. It's right before Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's a long one, so that's kind of easier to find. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. There's lots of pictures of Jesus as a shepherd. Have you ever considered that David was out shepherding the sheep when they called him to be king? Look at Isaiah chapter... I love hearing the pages turn, by the way. Talking of God, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm, carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Check out Ezekiel chapter 34. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. A few few books over. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. 
As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Jump down to verse 15. I myself will tend my sheep and make them lie down, declares the Lord. Jump to verse 31. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. Not to mention Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. This is a picture of God as the shepherd who is seeking after the sheep. What a beautiful picture of how Christ searched for you, searched for us. He didn't let us keep going astray, wandering about from one patch of grass to the next field over the next hill, appetite, the only thing driving what we were deciding to do. He seeks us and he knows, like the psalmist sings, that if we're away from the fold, we're missing being with the Father, where if we're with him, we lack nothing. We lie down in safe places, all for his name's sake, for his glory. I would say, too, beautifully, this is a picture of how Christ, in this very moment, is searching for the lost. It's moving that the shepherd searches wide. That stood out to me. You were to think about finding a sheep that wandered away, and then you compare it to how you would look for a lost coin. That's coming up. You would look wide. You would open your eyes wide and look over the horizon. And you would walk over another hill and maybe get to the top of the hill and look out to see if you notice anything. And, and I wonder for us, again, if we can try and follow Jesus and become like him and do what he's doing, how are we searching wide for the lost? We have a trip this summer where we're going down to Mexico. And I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but if you've done missions in a foreign country, particularly one that is third world and in severe poverty, you you start to see that there's people very far away that you have to search wide for that do not know the Lord. When I was in college, I got to go to Kenya. I've told about this a little bit. Um, The average, this is in 2006, the average daily wage for a person is $5 a day. Actually, it's funny because yesterday our son did two hours of work to raise money for his missions trip, and the couple paid him $5, and he was ticked. <laughs> I was like, bro, you're 11. I'm like, chill out. <laughs> and I, I said that at first, and I was like, I'm really sorry. I know it's right. He's, what did he say? I thought they were going to give me like 50. So side note, if kids ask you to do yard work, like stop overpaying them. You're like ruining the economy of our children, like... I only got five. I'm like, you can't even make a wage legally. Yes, any amount is good. Anyways, $5 a day. I remember when we went there, I, we go to the home of the host family and it's poverty. Concrete floors, concrete walls. It was a three bedroom home for the husband and wife. They had a, a few kids and then me and the other missionary stayed in one of their rooms. They had slightly running water <laughs> that would drip if there was enough pressure. But do you know that I realized... Uh, that they were one of the wealthiest people in the neighborhood because the next day we went out and they don't have row houses. They have, it's like row homes or like row rooms. There's apartments that is a central hallway and each room is its own house where a person sleeps and cooks and bathes in one room. And I was like, it could have been worse. But the perspective of getting this long view, this searching far and wide that there are people all over the world that are far from Christ and lost, and he searches for them like a shepherd searches for the one lost sheep. And a clear theme which recurs throughout these parables is rejoicing. Verse 5, joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Verse 6, rejoice with me. Verse 7, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. And ask yourself the question, why was there rejoicing? Was there rejoicing because this sheep was super special? It had produced a lot of fleece. It's going to make super big lamb chops because it's the biggest lamb we've had. We can't lose this one. Scripture 
paints the picture that the only reason there is rejoicing is because the sheep was lost. Nothing else about it. It was lost and it's found. So rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. So the first is the lost sheep, how we stray. And I would just say, man, it's daily too. Every day he searches after us. Verse 8 goes into the second of the three of the woman with the lamp and the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You might ask practically, how could someone lose a coin in their home? You come to our house, you'll find coins all over the place and cracks of furniture. But they actually, archaeologists today can find out when a home was occupied based on coins they find in crevices of that home. It mostly was either some type of compacted dirt with rocks in between to make it a little bit more concrete. And there were little cracks that coins could go in and get lost. And as the sheep shows how we've been astray, what does the coin show us about humanity is that we are helpless. Think about a coin can't call out. A coin can't, contrary to our culture's mantra, find itself. A coin probably doesn't even know it's lost. And we aren't inanimate objects, but the Bible tells the story over and over that spiritually we're lifeless without God working in us. That it's God who must first move in sinful humanity to reveal himself to us, to show us his glory, to commune with us, to move our hearts that we may seek after him. And it's an apt symbol for those of us who, seeing the requirements of God, realize that we're incapable or helpless of rising to them. To keep all the law, to love God with every part of yourself all the time and love your neighbor as yourself all the time, everywhere, But remember that the shepherd represents Christ. What does the woman with the lamp represent? The scholars would say it represents the Holy Spirit and the church. Consider, this isn't from the shack, just so you know. <laughs> but all throughout the Old Testament, there are pictures of the church being the bride. Think about Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. You don't have to turn there, but if, as I'm talking, turn to Ezekiel chapter 16. Isaiah 54, 5 says, for your, meaning that he's talking to Israel, so for you, Israel, the maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Go back to Ezekiel, that's where we just were, right? Ezekiel chapter 16, starting in verse 8. Consider the picture that the prophet is making of God in his relationship with Israel. Later, I passed by. And when I looked at you, I saw that you were old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. That's wedding language that God's saying about Israel. Or even in the New Testament, you can look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. It says, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Husband to wife, Christ to church. And as a community throughout which the Holy Spirit reveals God's truth, we are a light. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Flip over to the right and you go, you're making us turn a lot today. And I am. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. You probably know this one. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Or later on in the New Testament, when Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, second, uh, Philippians 2 verse 14, it says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing or muttering, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked, crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And Revelation even has the symbols of a woman and light depicting the people of God. 
One passage is Revelation 1, verse 20. The seven stars are the, sev- are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So consider the work of the Holy Spirit through the church to seek that which is lost, inanimate, helpless. Again, this is the compelling beauty of God. That people are helpless unless He searches for them. They can't do anything to merit being found apart from Him working in them. And it's not just that we're hidden and enabled. Sometimes it's hidden in the invisible crevices of society, the fringes of the social order. Maybe that's even your story. You were invisible to everyone else. You knew that you were helpless in your sin before a holy and just God. But the Holy Spirit, working through His bride, the church, sought you out, served you, ministered to you, and brought you back. And consider, too, how the shepherds search far and wide. How does the lady search for the lamp? She can't search far and wide for a lost coin. What does she do? She gets down and she searches near and narrow, laser-focused, right? Squinting eyes, focusing, lifting up furniture, moving the plant, shuffling the bowls, maybe even sweeping the broom to try and see if she can move anything. If we're following Jesus and becoming like Jesus and doing the things that Jesus is doing, do we have a laser focus for the lost that are right under our feet? Think about it. We do this thing, uh, the Great Turkey Countdown, every November, and I remember the first time I did it. We took all of our kids. We've been doing it every year. I know a lot of the people in the church do it, and I was shocked that I was bringing a Thanksgiving meal to someone who lived right around the corner from me, and I had literally never noticed the house until I pulled up a week and a half before Thanksgiving to drop off a meal. Not to say because you're poor, you're lost, but I go, I I didn't, it's been right under my feet, all around me. It's the same picture of the lost coin is that there's stuff all around. There's people that you are at work with. There's people at your third spaces. There's people in your neighborhood that you say hi to every day who are lost and helpless. And do we have eyes? to seek them. And again, the beautiful recurring theme, rejoice with me, verse 9. Verse 10, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The next parable in Luke is the prodigal son, but as I've previously mentioned, we're not doing that today. Prodigal means extravagantly Wasteful, by the way. Another nugget, verse 20. says, while he was still a long way off. That's it. No more. Just stop. There's so much. Verse 25 gets to the older son. Remember, it's a one out of a hundred, one out of a hundred sheep, one out of ten coins, one out of two sons. But if you keep reading the prodigal son story, we often probably don't even remember much about the older brother. But it's a really clear conversation that Jesus felt compelled to tell people. Verse 25, meanwhile, this is Luke 15, verse 25, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing again, like they're rejoicing. It's like when your annoying neighbor has a party way too late. Like, turn it down. That's kind of what the elder brother's doing. He hears it and he's like, what's going on? Verse 26, so he called one of his servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf. That that would have been enough to feed an entire village, the fattened calf. Because he has him back safe and sound. And I just want to say, uh, before we read the next verse, Pay attention to the father's pursuit of even the older son. He, he, he runs towards the son who comes home, right? We, we're going to get to that next week. But look at how he pursues him in verse 28. Because the question remains, if you have a prodigal son who runs away, a prodigal brother who uh, 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 like insults your father and does wasteful, reckless living, and then they come home, how would you respond? 
How would you say if maybe you've been a Christian your whole life and there's a person, maybe a good friend, and they've lived with reckless abandon, doing whatever they want, and then all of a sudden they make a deathbed confession? You go, that's great, but really? Maybe someone who uh, gives their life to Christ and you see them come to the church and you go, well, maybe they're just doing it because they need help. Maybe they're doing it just because they need money. Maybe they need counseling. We should save benevolence for like the real people that are part of our church, not those prodigals. Because I think the key point of this older son is that that was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And, and if we're not careful, it can be us. But look at the father's pursuit of even the older son in verse 28. The elder brother became angry and refused to go to the party. Fattened calf, your brother's home, and he doesn't even show up. So his father went out. He left the party. Left the brother that he hadn't seen for years. And pleaded with him. But he, the older brother, answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. What a, what a mindset. And never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf. All of it is really true. He can't wrap his mind around why he hasn't had a party with his friends with even a little calf. You you take the biggest one reserved for the best occasions for this son of yours, right? Notice how he calls him. When this son of yours, he's also his brother. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Look at verse 32. But we had to. We had to celebrate. And notice how the older son describes the prodigal. He says, this son of yours. Verse 32, the father says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because what? This brother of yours is lost. He's found, he's dead, and he's alive again. There's uh, one really faulty way of understanding your relationship with God. And that it is uh, life under God. There's a great book called With by a guy named Sky Jatani. And he says there's four bad postures we can have with how we relate to God. And one is that life under God. Meaning I'm going to do all of the things that God tells me to do. And then God surely will bless me and be delighted with me. That is the root of religion, not of the gospel. And this is what the elder brother is holding on to. I'd slave for you. We are slaves of Christ. We're his servants. He's not wrong. But he expected because of his obedience, his righteousness, that he also would get these things. And when somebody's not righteous, that the father would punish them and maybe not gladly accept them back. But there's two uh, opposite examples that Jesus actually helps us with, where he talks about this idea of expecting my righteousness to merit certain behaviors. The main idea is that God must bless me because of how faithful I've been. God shouldn't bless this prodigal because they've recklessly abandoned their calling as a son. John chapter 9 verse 2 is a negative example with the man born blind. The disciples actually go to Jesus and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The understanding that if you're blind, something happened of unrighteousness. Did he sin or was it his parents? Because you don't just get blind for no reason. What does Jesus say in verse 3? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That sometimes bad things happen and it's not a consequence of that person or their parents sinning. But there's a positive example too, Matthew chapter 19. The young man with great wealth comes and he's like, I, I, you know, how do I get to eternal life? And he goes, you know, keep all the commands. And he says, I've done it since I'm young. And he goes, well, sell all you have and give it to the poor. And what does the story say is that the young man walked away sad. 
And then what does Jesus say as a response? Because in the first century, and still today, like probably in my heart and in yours, is that if God gives me wealth, it's because I've been doing good things. If he makes this young man wealthy, it's because he's righteous. Everybody in the first century believed you were only wealthy if God was blessing you. But what does Jesus say in Matthew 19, verse 23? Jesus then said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. They thought if you were rich, you were already in. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for them, for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples heard this. They were astonished. They said, who then can be saved? If not the wealthy, who could be saved? And God, through Jesus, says, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And this older brother has this mindset that I have good things because I've been living good and God's been blessing me and I don't have bad things because I haven't been living bad and God hasn't seen fit to give me blindness or curse me or anything like that. But the Father pursues him just the same. I'll tell you that what I need to hear and what I believe we as a community need to hear again this morning, along with being the stray sheep And the helpless coin is the heart of the Father. The message in uh, Luke 15, verse 31 says it this way. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time. Everything that is mine is yours. Hear that today. If you're in Christ, you get to be with him all the time. He's he's with you right now. He's with you when you leave. He's with you when you lie down and when you get up. He's with you when you go to work or go to school. He's with you when you're with the difficult family member. He's with you when you're with the annoying neighbor. <laughs> he's with you when you're at the gym and you just want to work out, but he's prompting you to talk to some random person that you've never met. What does he say? You are with me all the time. Everything that is mine is yours. This is a wonderful time, and we had to celebrate. Again, this brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. He's not just the prodigal son. He's your brother. The angels in heaven are celebrating. All of heaven is celebrating. The father and the lost son are celebrating, but this parable also ends without resolution. That's the end of it. He's alive again, he's lost, and he's found. What does the older brother do? Does he go in? Please? And anytime there's an open parable, it invites us to consider, what are we going to do? Are we going to be like the older brother? And maybe you're already thinking it, because I've thought it in the past. I don't think it as much anymore because I've been reprimanded. We're doing a lot of work for Easter. We're going to have a photo booth. Why can't we have a photo booth like other Sundays? I like photo booths. Here we're going to have live animals. It's still a question mark, by the way. You got real excited. Why do we need live animals on Easter? That's ridiculous. It's about the cross and the empty tomb. Why are we spending so much time planning and praying for this one service? We should do it for all of them, which isn't wrong. It's because next Sunday... Probably more than any other Sunday out of the entire year, any other day out of the year, as people who are far from Christ hear about Easter get invited, not just by our church, every church. I drive by, I see First Baptist has all their signs up. I'm like, those are great signs. Hope you get a lot of people. See all the ads that are on your social media to go to Easter, to go to a Sunday service next Sunday, that that coming, this coming Sunday, more people are going to restore their relationship with Christ. They've run away as the sun Or they're going to be found for the first time as the helpless coin. They've wandered because they don't even know any better like the stray sheep. And on that Sunday, more people are going to celebrate in heaven because more people are coming to life for the first time. And as much as we can be a little jaded or even look at churches that maybe go more intense than us about Easter and, you know, they do Easter egg hunts and helicopter drops, which I'm like, that'd be sweet. My kids would love it. (laughs) I I think we have to ask ourselves, like, will we go to the party? We were astray. 
We were wandering bite to bite. Whatever our appetite said was good, we'd eat it. Jesus sought far and wide for us, brought us home. We were helpless. Friends, you were helpless. There's nothing in you that sought after God until he sought after you. And when you came, heaven celebrated. Some of y'all were messed up beyond belief. A lot of us were kids, but your kids are messed up too. But can we as Christians who are with God all the time and have everything, can we see next week and, and really just this idea of it's simple to invite people to church for sure. It's silly how much effort we make in like sharing the gospel. We should have a relationship. I get all of that, but we need to be a people who have the heart of not the older brother, but the heart of the father. I had to celebrate. Your brother was gone. Now he's back. So how do we respond? A couple key things. As we head into Holy Week, I don't know your tradition. It's, there's a lot of days this coming week that are like different. They call it a Maundy, I don't know how to pronounce it, Maundy Thursday, which is hard to say. Maundy Thursday. There's Good Friday. I'd love for you guys to join us at Cedar Creek. It's Holy Saturday. But I wonder if even this week you could take a different posture in your own life to prepare your heart for resurrection. Maybe it's with your family. You do something different. Chris and I were talking last night. I had some ideas like, could we do something a little different this week in our evening time with our kids just to make it more intentional? What is that different? Even if it's just, yeah, sure, every day. You know, you're like, oh, it'd be great to have like worship and devotionals as a family. Or it'd be great to, you know, wake up half an hour earlier to pray for the lost. And you're like, well, I should do that every day. Yes. <laughs> but like, what if we can start doing something different this week and just take some intentionality around celebrating resurrection? The second thing that I would challenge you with is could you this morning be able to praise God? If you're in Christ here this morning, two very clear images have been just given to you. That you were a stray sheep and he sought for you and he found you. He carried you back on his shoulders. Got, I mean, think about how dirty sheep are when they wander, when, just in general, then it's wandered off and he puts them over, he doesn't care. He, he puts you over his shoulders, lovingly cares, carries you back. The lost coin, you, you couldn't do anything and God sought you and he found you. So church, could we praise him this morning? Can we make much of him? Amen, amen. And I think as we worship and as we praise, you say, God, don't let my heart be like that older brother. God, I repent of the times when my heart is like the older brother, when I scoff at the prodigal who comes home. I'm going to invite us to stand. Our band's going to lead us, and I'm going to pray for us. Would you, would you stand with me? God, I thank you that you sought for me. I thank you that you sought us out. Just looking out across the room, I have uh, a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ that I wouldn't have any of you if it weren't for God seeking us out. God, we thank you. We're not, we're not worthy of you rescuing us. I pray for maybe the people here today that uh, know they've wandered. They know they've strayed. Pray for the people who feel helpless. They're stuck in a situation or with their own sin. I wonder if that's you, maybe you just admit it to God right now and just say, God, I can't do it. I need you to find me. I need you to help me again. So Holy Spirit, would you have your way? Our hearts, our minds, our soul, our strength. 
We give you this time. As the band uh, leads us, there are people that will be at these prayer stations. If you need prayer, you may make your way down and they would love to pray with you and for you.